These attacks linked to him in the New York metropolitan area, including uh, a New Jersey uh, beach resort community at Seaside. Uh, ISIS is not claiming credit for any of this. It is claiming credit for multiple uh, stabbings at a mall in Minnesota. Uh, the, the guy who orchestrated that attack has since been killed by authorities at the scene. But former Minnesota Governor Tim Pawlenty is here on, on what we can learn about what went down there and why ISIS is claiming that this guy, uh, Governor, is being called a, a soldier for the Islamic State. So they identify with him, they identify with this knife-wielding guy, just went on a rampant attack, started questioning people as to whether they were Muslim or not. What's going on? Well, as your listeners may or may not know, or viewers may or may not know, is Minnesota is the home to the largest concentration of Somali <coughs> refugees and immigrants of any place in the country, Neil. And where do they congregate or do they? It, well, throughout the state, but there's the largest concentration in Minneapolis. In fact, some people refer to one neighborhood in Minneapolis as Mini Mogadishu. This individual whose father has identified as somebody who was Somali, grew up in Kenya, and then migrated either as an immigrant or a refugee to Minnesota. Now, one thing to keep in mind, the person who is on site, who is the real hero here, Jason Falconer, right. law enforcement official, off-duty, a marksman, and it really underscores the value of having somebody who's trained with a firearm available to respond Can to these circumstances. Can you imagine this guy was going? Yeah, it's no just one was stopping. Horrendous, horrendous. But but we have a large concentration of Somali immigrants. But as governor, how did you handle that separate little society? You know, it's a challenge. When I left the governorship in 2010, one of the things I mentioned to my successor is this is a largely new and somewhat insular community. It's hard to penetrate from an intelligence and law enforcement standpoint. And there's very little insight as to what is going on in this community. And Neil, we have already had numerous people from this community, either as recruiters or subjects of recruiters, being recruited to go back to Somalia and engage in war there. And there's an Al-Qaeda affiliate, increasingly an ISIS affiliate in Somalia called El Shabaab, which some people may have heard of or just called it Shabaab, and they're trying to influence the Somali committee in the uh, community in the U.S. And to go, work go to Somalia and fight. But more often than not, Governor, uh, they work on young men. Absolutely. Right? And what do they uh, appeal to? How economically uh, angry they are, upset, disappointed? Well, think about that argument, Neil. If you're coming from Somalia to Minneapolis right. and then be subject to the argument that you're somehow now, you know, economically disadvantaged, at least in relative terms, through the lens of somebody who's been here, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But it's more, let's, let's be candid, it's more about jihad. It's more about a religious uh, assault or a religious fight. And increasingly, there's worry about this not being just go to Somalia and fight or blow yourself up. It's go to the Mall of America or go to some other place in Minnesota and have an incident like this. And that's apparently what happened in this case. Now, Very troubling. What is this controversy, Governor, about these so-called no-go zones? Authorities don't go in there, leave them alone, they'll leave us alone. I don't know what the understanding is. Are there equivalents of that within the Minneapolis area, or is it just an understood thing? You just there's no reason to interfere if you don't have to. Yeah, no, I wouldn't go so far as to say there's a no-go zone. There's clearly a, a, a concentration of Somalis. Many of them, all, you know, most of them, are law-abiding and trying to make a life for themselves in Minnesota and America. There's a presence there as a result, and given some of the past. The bigger challenge is the community is very insular. It's very difficult to penetrate. They're, they're not uh, as assimilated as you, some would like them to be in terms of any sort of conversation or dialogue with law enforcement or otherwise. So. Yeah, on this knife wielder, uh, no one's talking about it. And obviously, he must have friends and contacts, but no one's mentioning it. Well, the, the friends and contacts that are quoted in the Minneapolis paper this morning, Neil, say that he was, you know, an A student, you know, well liked, all the usual stuff. We never would have expected it was him. Just goes to show you the danger and the difficulties of identifying and stopping these lone wolf attackers. You know, uh, early on in the race, when Donald Trump was running, he said that maybe you have to think twice about the Muslims who come into this country. He has dialed that back somewhat. But uh, he still raises it. What do you think? Well, I think there's a difference between being compassionate and being naive. And you talk to these people who are screening uh, refugees these days, you know, it is a very difficult job. The system is not perfect. And I think we would all be well served by taking a pause and making sure that those systems uh, are rigorous and as robust as possible. Do you think they are? The administration says no, I don't think there's a year and a half process they're. here. No, I don't not think I think they could be a lot tougher. And I'm not in favor of a Muslim ban. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying we shouldn't be naive about allowing people to come to this country from areas that have concentration of terrorism or concerns in that regard without the most robust screening possible. All right. Switching from Minnesota, Governor, we're learning from our Catherine Herridge 
that uh, the bombing suspect in New York, Rahani, was known to authorities. How he was known, we don't know. How he got on their radar, we don't know. Um, what do you make of that and whether there was a failure to work on that intelligence data or to share it more or maybe there wasn't anything there to take the next step. There may well have been intelligence failures or, or follow-up failures we'll see in the coming hours and days as the facts unfold, Neil, but this problem is growing to the point where it, in Europe it is overwhelming law enforcement and security officials. It, we run the danger of that happening in the United States if we don't put more resources into this, if we're not more aggressive, if we don't invest in those capabilities. Privacy groups immediately and get, a, get annoyed. And get annoyed at that. Well, but, but you've got to make the trade-off between security and privacy. And it's hard to enjoy your privacy if you're dead. You know, well, for security's got to come uh, paramount. Do you think the way this is all unfolding, that uh, some have said it feels like a warm-up act, like someone was practicing for something bigger? Well, you we think about the multitude, the magnitude of the number of people involved, increasing sophistication, access to information on the Internet, as your previous guest just mentioned. It doesn't take much of an imagination to see this escalating in larger in magnitude, larger in scope, larger in number, Neil. Do you look at this as a war? The administration I do. does not. And they'd be careful to use that type of language because it gives these guys a greater uh, reputation than they deserve. I think you have to call it what it is. Words matter, and you need to tell the truth. They've declared war on us. They've declared jihad on us. It, it, President Bush used the war on terror for a reason. And you've got to be purposeful. You have to be clear. You have to be declarative. You have to say what you mean and mean what you say. And unfortunately, we're not seeing enough of that today. Uh, Donald Trump wants to increase the military budget. I assume that would include our, our going after terrorists. He has said within the first 30 days he became president, he'd want a report from his top generals advocating how and, and, and a detailed plan to eradicate all of these elements. Doable? It absolutely is doable. Sadly, you saw the effect of military force through Vladimir Putin in Syria. You know, he turned the dynamics in Syria because of the use of force. I think there was a moment in time in Syria and other places where had we been more aggressive, had we been more declarative, had we been willing to make more of a commitment, albeit at more risk, we would be better off than we are today in terms of being proactive and preempting some of these activities. Governor, not to belabor the financial community, but it's giving a collective shrug to all of these developments. We saw something similar, sir, in, in Paris and in Belgium after the attacks there. I know in Paris the markets were briefly shut down. Are you surprised that are we getting too resigned to this or used to this? Complacency is one of our biggest enemies here. And I hope whether it's the markets or everyday citizens or anything in between, you know, we all stay focused on this as one of the most important threats facing our nation. And we all need to rise to the challenge. When I ran for governor as early as 2001 and 2002, I made the point that terrorism was coming to Minnesota. Terrorism might be coming to the U.S., obviously. And I was ridiculed for raising the issue by my opponent and others. And in fact, Zacharias Musawi, the would-be you know, 13th 911 attacker, trained in Minnesota. That came out after That's I right. made those comments. But no one is immune. No place is immune. This is one of the greatest challenges of our time. I believe we are at war in this regard and we should take it to that level and be serious about it, more serious about it. Governor, thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Always appreciate it.